Thanks for tuning in. This is our next episode of our WBL series, and I'm speaking with two inspiring women, Sarah Richardson and Sarah Ratner. They're going to show us some of the magic of WBL and what networking actually looks like. And spoiler alert, it is just not that complicated, especially when you have so much in common. For Sarah and Sarah, this includes passion for the populations that they serve, helping seniors lead healthier lives, helping those with opioid addiction stay in recovery programs. And they also share some of the challenges that they've had along the way in their own career journeys. And those challenges led to self-reflection as well as next level opportunities. They're gonna share that as well as a whole lot of advice. If you want to hear more of these incredible stories, please do subscribe to Inspiring Women. You'll hear them every single week. But now let's hear from Sarah and Sarah. This is Inspiring Women. I'm Laurie McGraw. I am speaking today with two senior executives of companies that are a billion or multi-billion dollars, and they are seasoned executives in their roles. First, I'm speaking with Sarah, Sarah Richardson, who is the Senior Vice President and Chief Digital Officer of Tivity Health. And I'm also speaking with Sarah Ratner. So two Sarahs here, and um, she is the president of Nomi Health, which is a payment systems company that is looking to transform healthcare and not just rewire it. And Sarah and Sarah, thank you for being on Inspiring Women. Thank, thank you. Here. Thank you. All right. So what's interesting about this conversation in terms of what we're going to talk about today is that Sarah and Sarah, until last night, we did not even know each other, but through a conversation here at the WBL conference, where it's all senior executive women, um, they learned that just the it, taking information and technology and transformation, that they can really innovate in what you're doing, your important work. Maybe Sarah, we could just start with like a little bit of the, who are you and a little bit about the work that you do. Yeah, Lori, thank you. And it's absolutely true. When you meet people at WBL, there's this kindred spirits that come together and think about how do you solve the problems that we're facing every single day? Every single one of us is about creating solutions that are lasting and lasting beyond even our tenure in some of these organizations. So I've been with Tivity a little over two years. I have a background in healthcare and hospitality. I always have loved bringing those two together. And at Tivity, I get to do that in not only helping people age into longer, healthier, happier, independent lives, with Vernalong Plus and our Prime platforms, we do that throughout the continuum of people's fitness journey so that when you do turn 65 and you have a Medicare Advantage plan that allows you to have silver sneakers, you're already familiar with our products, you're already living the lifestyle that we have. And then you wrap that with even our whole health living products that allow you to think about alternative ways to stay healthy, whether it's Accu, Cairo, et cetera. It's just a wonderful place to be after all the years of being in hospitals and primary care, specialty care, any continuum, academic and otherwise for-profit, not-for-profit, Everything I've learned has brought everything together into the work that we're doing at Tivity, and it's such a rewarding place to be and, and a way to serve our community and in aspects that I hadn't previously. So as you reinvent your career, you also reinvent the things that you're looking to solve too. It's pretty special. Well, it's also a, t a time and you know, the 330 million people who live mm -hmm. in the United States, I mean, the, uh, was it 10,000 people are going on to Medicare every single month? I mean, those mm -hmm. numbers are staggering. Yeah. People are living longer, maybe not healthier, but they're certainly um, wanting to be more independent. So how is Tivity sort of accomplishing sort of like taking care of people? I mean, we're coming out of a pandemic where we had a tremendous amount of old people who were the people who were, um, you know, whether it is just how it impacted their lives, but also, you know, how it impacted their health. What's Tivity doing in that area? Here's what I love about Tivity. We take an inordinate amount of care and time to communicate and share ideas and gather data with Capitol Hill, with the Healthy Aging Coalition, with all of our payers, with our members to understand that pre-pandemic, people went out and did things socially and in person. So when the pandemic hit, and it was prior to my time at Tivity, but I've been able to continue to modernize the platforms that allowed for the digital aspect of wellness. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't just the fitness aspect. That was loneliness and isolation and ways to communicate with others if they hadn't had that opportunity to do it. And seniors were slower to come out of the pandemic. That second wave that hit really threw people for a loop. They were like, oh my gosh, now I still can't even go do the things I want to be able to do. Well, Tivity has all these platforms and all these abilities for people to go and do those things. So now as we track all the data about seniors and their and their habits today and they're reporting to us, I'm ready to go back out. I'm ready mm -hmm. to go be with people. What's wonderful is we've created a truly hybrid environment. And there's all this belief that if seniors aren't as digitally 
aware of how to use products. They are very aware. I'm, I'm sure you get the question all the, all the time, 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 right? In See, terms of very digitally literate. Mm -hmm. They have to keep up with their kids and their grandkids. And in some cases, great grandkids, they know how to use the technology. So we make it available in myriad platforms, whether you're on your iPhone, whether you're you know, on your smart TV, whatever you choose and how you want to engage with us, we are now available to you in all of those formats. And we're modernizing all the time and adding new relationships like the burn along acquisition. So it's the space where if we're using our products now, when we turn 65, we're going to continue to use those products, the activity sponsors. And what's most important is that that wellness journey begins in some cases in childhood. And so you're not going to start to go see us when you're 65. So how do we make sure we grab you even before we call them age ins mm -hmm. and have a healthy lifestyle so you can be healthy and independent, which is what most people want to do. They want to age at home. Yep. To yep. do that, you need to be as independent as you can. Well, guess what? Strength, balance, agility, quickness, yep. all the things that you train. With well, your we're going to come now. back. We're going to come back to that because I think innovation is one of the things that sort of like spark, spark the, um, you know, just like a uh, interesting conversation that the two of you were having, Sarah, let's talk about you. So like at Nomi health, what, what do you do at Nomi health as president? Sounds like you do everything. Well, <laughs> I run government programs. So similar to Sarah, Medicare, Medicaid, public sector, VA, um, Nomi health is really trying to rebuild not rewire healthcare. Mm -hmm. And we initially did that through a payment systems, allowing real-time payment to providers. Think of providers who get paid 90 days post-treatment, um, huge value to be able to eliminate a lot of that waste along the way. In the process of building Nomi, we've developed an insights and analytics platform. Mm -hmm. We have a whole pharmacy management company from PBM Wholesaler uh, Pharmacy. We have a open network that allows kind of bundled payment solutions. And we have a population care program. Mm -hmm. And that's where I'm focused today because to me, healthcare is personal. And so much of what we do is derived from our experiences. And for me on the population care side, we are developing an opioid use disorder mm -hmm. called SUCCESS. It stands for Substance Use Coordinated Care and Extended Support Services. The opioid problem, it kills more people, twice as many people as car accidents twice as many people as gun deaths every year. Mm -hmm. And it is our new um, pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so we're really focused on how do we leverage technology, boots on the ground, all the different types of ways that we deliver healthcare to a population that is most underserved right now. Uh, there's a lot of substance use programs out there for people who can afford it. We focus on people who are the most marginalized, the most underserved, Medicaid, Medicare Advantage, um, people who are uninsured. And so we're trying to take all of our strengths, all of our superpowers and bring it to this new population. So how for a payments platform type of company in terms of like, you know, what you, you said earlier, which is like not just rewiring, mm -hmm. how did that, how does that translate to focusing on such an important issue, social issue and the pandemic absolutely exposed to all of us, mm -hmm. you know, how bad it really was. And it only got worse during the course of the pandemic. Yep. If you think of a payments platform, it's a way to connect people across a continuum from uh, payer, buyer to provider. Mm -hmm. And what we're able to do is we are able to connect every single point along the continuum so that somebody is not lost along the way. You see people who fail recovery because they're dropped. They don't get that connection from prison to social worker, from prison to clinical care mm -hmm. and our solution allows that common thread that keeps somebody in recovery. And so we can understand where anybody is at any given point in time. We can bring solutions to Medicaid providers who traditionally are underpaid, allowing them to receive reimbursement real time. Mm -hmm. So additional value. And we create networks so that people want to participate in this space one in four providers say, this is too messy for me. Mm -hmm. We want to make that two and four, three and four, everybody should participate. And so our payment platform really enables part of that. Yep. And how long have you been at Nomi Health? Only about eight months. Oh, really? So yeah, it's new for you. It's so, new. so this is interesting because you're both working at, you know, significant problems and at scale. You're at companies at scale and you're senior executives. So maybe Sarah, we'll start with you, but just like, how did you get here? So how did, you know, you're, you're, that's a very big program. It's not just a, an important idea in a startup world. You're doing it at scale. So what's your, what's your, like, how did you get here to be this level of professional as president? Yeah. So I started my career as a healthcare M&A lawyer um, and call myself a recovering lawyer because I don't practice <laughs> anymore. 
Um, but ultimately, it led me into early stage venture backed organizations where we could solve problems in a very nimble way. Mm -hmm. I worked on the payer side, the provider side, pharmacy. And what was consistent is that we were trying to solve problems that where people could not get access, they mm -hmm. could not pay for care. So everything from minute clinic to pharmacy to working with tribal reservations. Mm -hmm. And so that focus on the underserved mm -hmm. has what has led me to know me to say, we can solve big problems. Know me is a big thinker. And mm -hmm. we think grand and ways to really solve this issue nationally, globally. So you were you were professionally looking for yes. a big vision and then being committed. Sarah, I'd love to just like get a little bit of your history. So, you know, two years at Tivity Health, but like lots of years in very, very big companies. So what's your background? Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting because I started in the world's largest hotel casino in my career. I started at MGM Grand when I was 19. Oh my gosh. So I always knew, talk about scale. Yeah. I mean, I've always known like, hey, this is the biggest place in the world for what we do. So I've never been afraid of the biggest challenge it's out there, the, the size of things that could occur. So I spent most majority of my career in Fortune 100 companies and I've dabbled back and forth in, in different environments, but all across the continuum of different delivery healthcare models and in hospitality. So when Tivity came on my radar, I was at Optum and I could have stayed with Optum and had you know 10 different adventures over the next 15, 20 years. I had done what I wanted to do there. And so it's very thoughtful in the approach to what would be next. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful that in my career, I've been able to be I don't want to say choosy, but specific about what I was going to do in that next step. So Tivity showed up and my boss, uh, Richard Ashworth, who just left us for another opportunity, he and I met within 10 minutes, like we need to work together. Mm -hmm. and, and we did for the last couple of years because that ability to bring all of that knowledge into an organization that's a 30 year old brand that needs like a three year makeover. Mm -hmm. And that was super exciting. And he basically said, I will not ignore you, but I won't get in your way. Mm -hmm. And that's what everybody wants to hear in their career. They want to be like, hey, the last 30 years of my career were worth it to be able to have a boss say that, to build a team to do that, to have the support of the organization, to do the things we need to do. And that's a complete reskinning, remodernization and capability to have us be as nimble digitally as we are with the technology base, as we can with the programs and the communities that we're serving. Because the world changes that fast. Technology has to change that fast too. Keeping technology up to date is actually one of the harder things to do because technological debt builds up fast. Oh, yes. And to stay out of it, to get out of it and to stay out of it, that's my job right now. I also think it's just interesting that, you know, you came from hospitality. I mean, we're in healthcare. We all know that like, you know, healthcare is not the easiest to sort of interact with where it's patient access issues. Like, how's that helping you in terms of that background with what you're doing at Tivity? When I was an uh, undergrad at UNLV. Hera School of Hospital Administration, you read the book, Be My Guest by Conrad Hilton. And when he would go into his hotels, he would go and lay down in the bathtub and look up and see what he saw from the perspective that most people weren't going to look at. Huh. So my entire journey through healthcare, when I was in hospitals, when I was in primary care clinics, I would go and experience it either as a patient, ideally not as an admitted patient. I would go and visit the people that no one else was going to visit. Like who is a patient in our hospital that has no one to come visit them? Mm -hmm. And I would round every single day and meet people and the stories that I would learn. And I would ask about the journeys as much as the journeys of the clinicians providing the care, because those two have to come together and be congruent. And then for primary and specialty care, as an example, are you a patient of the services that you render? Well, in Tivity's case, I exercise almost every day. I haven't quite made it to the gym yet this morning. <laughs> I'll find a way today. Do you use your own products? If you're using your own products, you're your own champion. Mm -hmm. So whatever format that takes. So now I'm like, Hey, I spent years like crawling around in like all kinds of like dusty places and, and crazy places and hotels and hospitals. And yes, there's, you know, all the, the chances to learn. So now I just get to experience our programs by taking exercise classes and being like, what does that member experience look like for us? So I love just taking all the different aspects because it's always about how you consume a product that makes you want to use it. And do you trust that brand? Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. you want to use something, you're going to tell people about it. You're going to want to make it better every single day. That's part of my responsibility as a digital leader. Well, I think it's also interesting, again, I mean, you know, as senior executives of these enormous um, companies in terms of what you're doing, just, you know, when people talk about sort of like, you know, eat your own dog food or like whatever the sayings drink might be, champagne. drink your own champagne. Oh, that's a lot better. That is a <laughs> lot better. <laughs> you know, that you're actually doing it and you're doing it at scale. We're at the WBL conference. Again, it is an organization that is bringing senior executive women together. And you two just met last night. Mm -hmm. So um, what's, you know, people we talk about on Inspiring Women, so many senior women, um, you know, talk about the networking and how important this, this is to their careers. So 
what did you talk about? What what got you interested and in, you hit it off with each other in terms of like what you're interested in? What, what what's so exciting about the two two of your companies and you know what you're interested in doing together? Well, it became personal very quickly mm-hmm. in terms of what what Sarah's doing, what I'm doing, but then how does it, you know, healthcare is so common and being re- be able to reduce it to kind of a common denominator mm-hmm. and connect on that. It was just effortless. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we spoke about our personal circumstances, about our career journey, and, you know, you form lifelong relationships with just simple conversations like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you say, hey, you know what? We might be serving different populations right now, but where is the commonality behind that? Mm -hmm. And truly it's that, and WBL is a place where you're allowed to tell a personal story and not be judged for it. Right. Or not have someone say, oh, that happened in your life, or you're dealing with that. Because you look at different people in a room and you wouldn't know that they are dealing with, whether it's mental health in their family, addiction in their family, disease in their family, because most of those things don't choose any sector of the population. They happen to everybody. And so Mm -hmm. how do you solve those problems together? And what are we doing in our careers that allows us to have access to do that? So if I can use data to feed a company, for example, like Nomi Health to address a population, well, there you have it. And we don't have to be on the same team right now to connect the people that can make those things happen for one another and still be also, hey, guess what? Solving for the things that brought us to this practice in the first place. Yeah, well, I think this is like a sort of a great example of sort of what networking looks like in real time. I want to go to something else you have in common. This might not might not have struck you in your conversation, but for many women with, um, you know, executive women were impacted pretty significantly in the course of the pandemic with many of them dropping out of um, careers and whether that's burnout or just like a, you know, a career journey sort of like, you know, rethink. Um, That has happened, but not for the two of you. You took the opportunity to take a next level responsibility as senior executives. How did that happen? I mean, those are big leaps um, during interesting times. Sarah, why did you take the leap? Um, Well, I'm fortunate. I didn't have a little child to take care of at home. I had a spouse who had a flexible job. And so the pandemic allowed me to take a step back and say, really what is important. We saw so many people suffer, many people die, and it becomes very clear quickly Mm -hmm. what's relevant and what is irrelevant. And so when I started speaking with our CEO at Nomi, it became clear that this is a highly mission-driven organization, something where I could use my superpowers to make a difference. And it just was a no-brainer for me to take everything that we had learned during COVID and say, how do we apply it in different creative ways and be really nimble? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What about you, Sarah? So my last surviving parent passed away during COVID of cancer. Mm-hmm. And I was also fortunate in that I don't have small children at home. And so on that journey with my mom was how difficult it is to navigate care, which we all already knew, but the senior's journey mm-hmm. and the things that we can do to help our seniors actually live that whole space of longer, healthier, happier, independent lives. So after she was gone and Tivity was on my radar, I was like, I had such a love for seniors. Like I was, my, my grandmother was one of my favorite people in my life. My mother was literally my favorite person in my life. But don't tell my husband that because he now is that person. <laughs> he'll, right? he'll never hear he'll it. He'll person. never hear it. <laughs> female bonds as female relationships as women who taught me to be bold and strong and fearless and capable and do all those amazing things. They both were gone too. So they both passed away at 77. Mm-hmm. So at almost 50, I am on my own completely minus obviously my relationship with my husband, but all the, the main female leaders in my life are gone. Mm-hmm. And so it's my responsibility to a degree, not only to take everything they taught me to be, but to carry that on in a way that's, I don't want to say more meaningful because I've always had a purpose behind the work that I do, but being able to serve seniors right now is fulfilling a lot of things in my heart mm-hmm. and allows my head to also be connected. And when all the different parts are connected, uh, you can do amazing things. Mm-hmm. And so activity is a space that allows I believe my personal values and my professional values and all the things that I've worked for come together for the opportunities that are in front of us today. That's kind of incredible though. Both of you sharing this sort of like, you know, personal passion in your professional work that you're doing. Um, and again, at the level that you're doing it is um, impressive and amazing. Let's talk about some of the just the realities though. I mean, as senior executives and as women um, leading companies at scale, uh, that means that you didn't, it, well, there was no easy path to 
to get here. And one of the things I always like to draw out in Inspiring Women are some of those stories along the way that listeners can relate to. So maybe, you know, Sarah, just like a in the way back machine, something that maybe sort of like hit you, knocked you down, Mm -hmm. but you managed to sort of like get through something, some example that, you know, hit you along the way that, you know, you might share with listeners. Yeah. I mean, I've been asked to, you know, when I was on an executive team to get coffee, to take notes, all those things. Love that. that. Love that. Just, you know, (laughs) nauseating. But there was one point in my career where I was told that what I was wearing did not fit in Ah. and it was appropriate. You know, it's probably J crew or banana Republic or something appropriate and it didn't fit in. And I was the only woman on the executive team. And it was the most embarrassing, humbling experience. But what I learned is I had to be myself. I can't change because I'm not fitting into the norm of what a, you know, all male leadership team looks like. And it was hard to say, no, I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, But I also gained a courage that I'd never had before to stand up and use my voice in a different way. And that gave me a sense of confidence that I um, would never have had. And so how did you have that confidence? I mean, that would like knock the wind out of my sails in a very big way. It did. It, I cried. Um, I consulted my dear friends who are my board of advisors from Mm -hmm. WBL. um, And they gave me the confidence to say, oh no, Uh you, you fight back. (laughs) This is not okay. And really just knowing that people had my back, that I was thinking in the right way. I could test, you know, kind of my emotion. I could regulate my emotion as well. Cause I wanted to go back and like punch people in the face. (laughs) (laughs) And, um, it really taught me a lot about myself. And Mm -hmm. so I carry that with me painful, but it also is a reminder of use my voice, use my strength, use my superpower. Wow. That's so, so that's incredible. And also I love that you like, you know, consulted with others versus punching people, which um, is not ever a good idea. I don't think, I don't think (laughs) Sarah, how, how about for you? I left a wonderful position in a really high powered company. And I worked my way to the top there, the top of where I was going to be there. And took a a leap of faith. Actually, one of the women that's here at WBL today encouraged me to go after this new opportunity and for all the right reasons and all of the right outcomes. Mm -hmm. Truly. She was like, Hey, by the way, you're as high as you're going to get in this company for like the next five or 10 years. And I have a thing where I say, waiting for people to retire or die is not a career strategy. (laughs) So I made this leap of faith into this new organization and it was an absolute mismatch. Uh I mean, I'd been in the same place for 10 years and sort of ridden, you know, the wave of doing everything right and keep getting promoted. I went to this new company and it was a complete failure at the time. And so there was that negotiation of, hey, you should leave and and I shouldn't be here anymore. At the end of the day, you're basically negotiating not getting fired. Mm-hmm. And that was absolutely devastating to me. I had never had a career failure. I'd never not been the right person, the right fit, the right everything. I lost my complete identity because at that point in my life, my identity was my career, mm-hmm. 100%. Mm-hmm. And thank goodness for my husband because mm-hmm. he was like encouraging me the whole way. And of course, this is the poor guy that I like moved from one city to another And I said, Hey, guess what? We have to move again for my career. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like we're moving like, you know, 10 miles. We're talking like middle of the country to one side of the country to, Hey, guess what? Let's go back to California. Yep. And I had to convince a gentleman from the East coast where he's from to say, do you want to move to California? I know where I'm from. And that look where people are like, either love it or hate it. (laughs) That journey though, took me honestly, several years to overcome that. So I found a new job without an issue. That wasn't the, the problem. It was finding myself amongst all of that. Mm -hmm. And so now I am not defined by my career. My career is an element of who I am, but I didn't figure that out until I was like 44 years old. Mm -hmm. And now one of my responsibilities as a leader and even as a woman is to help people realize what their identity is because it can get lost in so many things that we have, childcare, parent care, our careers, our husbands, our lives, our partners, whomever, whatever that mix looks like. Women just keep getting squeezed into the middle. We leave ourselves out of the equation most of the time. So then how do you identify today? So your career is obviously big and is clearly important and impactful. So what else, like, how do you define yourself in a way that you can show up when the career is still clearly so important to who you are? I align my personal values, the things that I want to achieve in my career and my life. 
And I realized like, hey, my bucket list is longer than how long I may be alive. And mm-hmm. so I don't miss the vacations. I don't miss the birthdays. I don't miss the events that matter to me, but to everybody else too. So to me, it's defined by purpose. People are meaning making machines. Mm-hmm. And so if you can fit in all the things you want to be able to do in a way that doesn't make you feel like you got lost in the process, then go do the things you want to go do. An example is I'm leaving for a scuba diving trip in two weeks with my husband went to Indonesia. And I won't have internet for two weeks. We're jealous. We're just like sitting here a little jealous. <laughs> oh, and yeah. so we had a leadership class uh, last week at work. And we were talking about different leadership perspectives. And I said, is it okay for an executive to take two weeks off? Mm-hmm. And everyone in the room is like, yes. Like they want to do as well. And I'm like, then go do it. Because if you don't take your PTO, you're going to lose it. Yeah. And in no scenario, do you ever wish that you'd work those two weeks and not gone to Raja Ampat to go to the yep. most marine biodiverse place in the planet? Mm-hmm. So therefore, take your PTO, go live your life. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. They can all live together in a space. When I come back and tell those stories, mm-hmm. my team had a chance to shine while I was gone because they're in charge. Mm-hmm. And I can come back and tell you know world stories, but they're happy to give it back to me when I get back. That much I have learned over the years. Mm-hmm. Well, that's really inspiring to hear that. But what also is amazing is just, you know, as a leader to give that responsibility to others, to mm-hmm. share the spotlight Absolutely. and bring forward um, the people who are part of your team. So that's just excellent. Let's say sort of like flip that question a little bit in terms of, you know, not the knockdown kind of stories, but just as, you know, you be- grew up, I mean, I'm sure the jobs that you have today were not the ones that you were thinking about, you know, when you were starting out. I probably didn't even know that they existed. So something along the way that surprised you about yourself that has turned you into the leaders that you are. Sarah, what about you? Yeah, I guess it's the um, the ability to kind of lean ahead. Mm-hmm. Men have a tremendous gift to say, I'm I can do that role, even if they've never done it before. Mm-hmm. And I had the most amazing mentor early in my career who said, lean ahead and I'm going to show you how, and I'm going to give my trust to you to do that. Mm -hmm. And that kind of gave me the strength to say, there's jobs I've never done before, but I have the skills. Um, you know, I have the leadership qualities to be able to say, I can do that. And Mm -hmm. I've never done it. I, at one point in my career ran it. I mean, I was like the abuser of the call center, (laughs) the help desk. (laughs) I could not even turn on a computer, but but my leader at the time said, you know, lean into it. You've got the skills to solve problems and go do that. You don't need to learn how to code. Mm -hmm. And so it was that ability to say, how do I lean ahead confidently? Um, that helped propel a lot of what I've done today. So you took some great advice and you've actually were able to do it. That's mm-hmm. fantastic. Sarah, how about for you? IT was not my plan. Yeah. And yet, same thing. I had an incredible boss who, when I was 19 at the MGM Graham, she would always say, well, what do you want to do next? And I, I thought I wanted to run the casinos. I thought that was my thing. I was a casino host. And there's a whole hilarious story behind it that's a different time. But at the end of the day, I was working four to midnight swing shift. I went to school all day. And- IT was seven to seven. So at 7 p.m., things still broke, especially the, the phone systems and everything that I ran. You know, literally most of my career was in the basement, by the way. I started mm-hmm. out in the basement, the Morgan healthcare it was fascinating. But literally, they would break after hours. And so these tickets would pile up. And I'd be like, why isn't anybody fixing this stuff? You know, because mm-hmm. guests still need an experience. So I learned how to fix all that stuff after hours. And so yeah. there began my IT career simply because I didn't understand why we had to wait for someone else to do it. Like anything in my life, I'm like, I can do that. Uh huh. And then it literally became my entire career. That is amazing. So as we close out on this inspiring women um, conversation, so we all know so the statistics in terms of, you know, women around the executive table, there's not enough of us. The numbers are changing ever so slightly, um, certainly in the boardroom um, as well, but it's still, there's a lot of room um, to grow. So if each of you could just like give sort of, you know, your advice to younger women who want to be you, um, what would you say to them? Maybe Sarah, we'll start with you. Pay it forward. Mm -hmm. Always give that person the help, the leg up that they need, the confidence, and be the leader who they want to emulate. I love the fact that you take two weeks off because it gives other people the courage to say, well, if Sarah's doing it, I can do it. Mm -hmm. And so it's being that representative, uh, that model who can really help propel those individuals who you're trying to bring along in additional roles. And so I'd say, you know, pay it forward and be the the model 
that you've always wanted. And also, I mean, what's so great about that advice, you know, as you say, it's like, you know, as, as you yourself are pushing yourself forward and propelling your organization, as well as your own career, the bringing others yeah. with you is such a great way to do it. I love that. Sarah, what about for you? The ability to take the two weeks off I learned from Noel Williams. She was the CIO of HCA when I was a upcoming CIO. And she said, if I can't leave for two weeks, then I have failed all of you. Mm -hmm. So I learned that from her and I'm always grateful because that's something else I always bring forward to Sarah's point, paying it forward. It's also important to identify your successors and let them know that that's what you want them to be. Make sure that that's what they want too. Mm -hmm. And so my successor is, successor is identified. Her name is Beth Cooper. She's amazing. She's on my team. And it's either who goes first, me or her. And it's an ongoing joke because you're like, you guys are leaving. I'm like, not yet. Mm -hmm. like we're, we're, we've got lots of work to do. We're committed to our cause for this period of time. She's either going to become a CIO here or somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And so that's the plan. Mm -hmm. So when it's already a known thing, then it's not like it's you're not talking about it. It's like, yes, she's my successor. Yes. She's in charge while I'm gone. Yes. Bring her to these meetings, et cetera. And we spread that. Well, most of my leadership team from VP and director are females. Mm -hmm. And people ask me, we have a lot of women in it. And I'm like, you're welcome. Like, <laughs> yes. And I didn't go hire women. I yeah. hired qualified people and they happen to be women But because I'm very thoughtful about the networking I do every single day. Women are drawn to companies where there's strong women who support them. Mm -hmm. So women have to support women and women can be adversarial. Mm -hmm. And that's not what we foster here. It's not what we foster other organizations I'm a part of. So the most important thing after everything else, after being confident and strong and succession planning, et cetera, be nice. Mm -hmm. The one thing my mom and my grandma taught me, be nice. Mm -hmm. And when you're nice, good things will always happen. Mm -hmm. And truly the wrap around all of it is being kind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is, that is great advice. And that um, certainly hasn't always been the case. And I'm sure you've been in situations where that isn't true, but people remember it. You guys both model it and that is exceptional. So this has been an excellent, inspiring women conversation. I've been speaking with Sarah Richardson and Sarah Ratner, and I appreciate you both being here. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This has been an episode of Inspiring Women with Lori McGraw. Please subscribe, rate, and review. We are produced by Kate Cruz at Executive Podcast Solutions. More episodes can be found on inspiringwomen.show. I am Lori McGraw, and thank you for listening.